the main message I'd like to give you today is that technologies that we use co-produce our values and can even change them. Now, the link between values and technologies is a relatively recent one because morality is traditionally associated with people, not technologies. And today, I will show you how values and technologies are, in fact, intimately interrelated and co-evolve together. This message is very close to my heart, and I clearly remember the first time I experienced it. Back in 2011, I was still living in Ukraine, and I was working in the area of privacy, helping to introduce the national law on data protection. Now, this was not an obvious or straightforward law in a post-Soviet country, where it was a normal thing to go to a market and buy a CD with databases of people's addresses and cell phones for whatever reasons you might have had. Communism and sharing were always emphasized more than privacy, and only few people heard of or cared about data protection. But with increased use of digital technologies and internet, personal information could be shared online freely and in a matter of seconds, and thus potentially falsified, used inaccurately or intentionally to misrepresent people. Suddenly, privacy became important, and people demanded it as a right to the extent that it got codified in national law in 2011. Now, somehow before that, I haven't explicitly considered the massive impact that technologies have on our everyday lives, giving us an idea of what's important to us and even changing it. I clearly remember how, for instance, the prioritization shifted from the free sharing of information to value in privacy. And the meaning of privacy itself changed. It extended from covering the physical phone books to also including the digital information and the risks that go with it online. Moreover, in just a decade, privacy, previously endorsed only by some, became a shared moral principle and codified in law. To give you a different and more modern-day example, uh, consider the use of voice assistants. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen people on the streets dictating messages in their phones to be sent as text or asking their phone about the weather or to set up an alarm. Voice assistants do that and much more, increasingly in the form of smart speakers in your home, such as, for instance, Amazon's Alexa or Google's Home. But beyond being able to turn on the lights in your room and telling you how far the nearest pizza place is, Voice assistants also help to change the way we interact with each other. Because voice assistants promote a functional, short and command-based interaction, they actually help to redefine the norms of attention, courtesy, engagement and respect that we commonly expect from conversation partners. Moreover, they're not perfect in understanding human speech, and the users frequently need to repeat their questions over and over again, and sometimes they become very angry about it. Today, I hear a lot of complaints about the current generation of kids being glued into their smartphones. But what happens if we replace screens with voice-based technology, arguably the most natural way to interact? While the future is being shaped now, in my own research, I already suggest some preliminary consequences of this. For instance, more and more adults who own smart speakers notice an increased lack of manners in their children and even somewhat aggressive interaction with other kids. As one of the parents commented on YouTube, quote, I started saying please occasionally after our three-year-old started barking orders at the speaker, end quote. What often accompanies these observations is a disbelief that technologies do something more than what they were designed to do. Technologies make us aware of what is important to us and even help to redefine it. Put differently, technologies mediate our values. But if technologies are just the tools to be used by people, how can they do anything else than what they were designed to do? Leave alone influence our values. Today, I'd like to present the view developed by American philosopher Don Eide and Dutch philosopher Peter Paul Verbeek. 
that thinks that technologies are far from neutral tools in the hands of independent human subjects. On the contrary, because technologies present the world to us in a certain way, they actively mediate the way we see the world and how we act in it. And the ethical consequence of this is technologies also take part in morality, helping to shape our moral inclinations and our choices. And as I suggest, technologies also help to produce the meaning of our values and can even change it. So how do technologies mediate morality? Firstly, technologies help to shape our perceptions about ourselves, each other, and the world around. Coming back to the smart speakers example, consider a seemingly neutral fact that most of them have female voices. Now, this is not a coincidence, as many user studies by, for instance, Corso, Mitchell, Todorov, and others prove that people perceive female voices as warmer than the male ones as more trustworthy, more soothing and comforting, and as helpful, but not bossy. As a result, people are more willing to talk, to share their vulnerabilities and to share their information when technologies use female voices. But as Stanford researchers Nas, Green and Moon showed way back in 1997, giving technologies female voices promotes gender stereotypes. This finding was recently supported by a UNESCO study that showed how voice assistants shape an image of a woman as an obedient, ready-to-serve assistant who never says no and does not talk back. So, do these technologies help to democratize our society or take it a step back by helping to promote age-old stereotypes? To give you a different example, Consider how proliferation of the selfie culture, coupled with multiple photo filters, created new and, some say, unrealistic standards of beauty. A recent study in the Journal of American Medical Association suggests that it actually helped to foster new social norms and even new medical conditions, such as body dysmorphic disorder, when people want to have plastic surgeries just to look as the edited versions of themselves on the social media. So, are Snapchat and Instagram just the neutral tools to share pictures of our food and selfies? Or do they also help to determine what we see as normal? Secondly, technologies also help to shape specific situations of moral choice, emphasizing some options and reducing the visibility of others. Throughout my PhD research, I found out about a technology that lets you select who you want to have for a baby, a girl or a boy. So the sex selection technology is usually used in a medical setting and is often accompanied by an in vitro fertilization procedure, which is quite expensive and very invasive. Like I said, it's mostly used in a medical setting to help prevent the transfer of certain genetic diseases that pass either through a female or a male line. However, quite a few people would like to use this technology simply because they want to have a daughter or a son. Currently, the United States is the biggest country in the world that allows the use of sex selection technology for what they call as a family balancing reason. So, for instance, if a family already has two children of one sex, they may ask to have a child of the opposite one. What I only recently learned is that because the medical services are quite expensive in the United States, many people choose to travel to Eastern Europe as a cheaper hotspot for reproductive tourism, offering also such services as non-medical sex selection. What happens if this technology becomes much cheaper and you wouldn't even need to go to a hospital, but could use it at home? The new sex selection chip promises just that. It looks just like a SIM card from your phone that acts as the scales, only at a nano level. So to result in a girl, the sperm needs to have a, a pair of X chromosomes. And to result in a boy, a combination of X and Y. A man would need to present a drop of his sperm on the chip for sorting. Because an X chromosome has an extra leg compared to a Y chromosome, it is a tiny bit larger and thus heavier. And this difference in weight is significant at the nano level. 
and the sex selection chip promises to sort the sperm into the female and male groups. Now, to be sure, this technology is not likely to enter the market anytime soon because the researchers did not intend its use for humans, but rather for animals. However, it does raise interesting moral questions. So the sex selection chip essentially promises prospective parents to choose the sex of their child at home and at low cost. But as my research proves, this choice is actually very tricky. And it's tricky because we should be aware that sex is not gender, and the two terms should not be used interchangeably. But while the sex selection technology allows to select only the sex of the child, it is actually a promise of gender that it promotes. What happens if the child selected to be as female turns out to be not girly enough? And what about the people who do not fit in the female-male, girl-boy categories? After all, the sex selection technology makes only two options possible, deeply connecting sex and gender to the point of confusion. So the sex selection technology presents a very simplified choice to prospective parents, whereas I suggest that this choice is now more complex than ever. And let's even take a step back and ask ourselves, should we even be able to choose how our children turn out to be? Finally, on top of co-shaping our perceptions and co-shaping our choices, technologies also help to define the meaning of values. Technologies can help to either reaffirm the values that we have or challenge them, shift accents between them, or suggest entirely new value meanings. Let's take a walk down the memory lane to 2013, when Google Glass was a big new thing. It promised augmented vision, a voice assistant right in your ear, and being able to stay in the moment while sharing all of your experiences immediately online. But many people didn't like it, concerned that the camera embedded in glass violated their value of privacy. So many businesses declared their properties glass-free zones, and we even invented a new word to condemn the socially inappropriate behavior with Google Glass, being a glass hole. Now, I think this example is important because it shows how people were able to reaffirm their value of privacy even in the most public places, and in parallel created new interpretations of privacy related to memories, experiences, and in fact, lack of control of information. And I think this example is relevant now more than ever when such companies as Amazon and Snapchat come up with their own versions of smart glasses, inspired and learning from the experience of Google Glass. To give you a more regional example, consider how the spread of digital information and internet fostered a value to remember everything forever. And then 2014 marked an important moral and legal change in the European context, witnessing an introduction of the right to be forgotten. Now, I find it curious how in a relatively short amount of time, we switched in a diametrically opposite direction, first wanting to preserve and remember all the information we accumulated online, and then desperately wishing to forget it and be forgotten by the Internet. Thus, technologies are not the neutral tools, but actually do actively mediate the way we relate to the world, including our values. But this does not mean that people are the passive recipients of whatever technological progress brings our way. Technologies introduce new practices, new situations, and new choices that make us aware of what is important to us. Now, these new practices may challenge our existing values. But people continuously prove their inventiveness to actively shape what is important to them. Consider the recent privacy outcry related to the smart speakers. Evidently, companies such as Amazon, Google, and Microsoft employed people to listen to and analyze the conversations that the users had with their voice assistants. Earlier yet, Alexa had strange incidents of accidentally recording the private conversations of people and transmitting them over the phone to other people. While the companies behind these devices are very quick to update their terms and conditions, the users take matters into their own hands to actively shape what is important to them 
while still continuing to use these technologies. Some of the very creative appropriations of smart speakers include building a cover that continuously distracts the voice assistant by feeding white noise into it. And the voice assistant would respond to the user only when they use a specific wake word that they themselves designed for the speaker. Um, some people developed contextual uses for their smart speakers, for instance, unplugging them at certain times during the day. And yet others choose not to use them anymore. What these creative efforts show is a recognition that technologies do something more than what they were designed to do, and trying to actively figure out what that more exactly is. These efforts also show an active way of giving shape what is meaningful to people when using these technologies. Put differently, these examples that I've given you show how values are created in dynamic human practices with technologies in specific social and cultural contexts of the world. Now, this does not mean that technologies are the messiahs or the destroyers of our lives, or that people are the passive recipients of their bidding. While technologies mediate our values, we can actively give shape to these technological mediations. We can reflect on how we use technologies, what using them does to us and those around us, which feelings and preferences it provokes, and why. Once we become aware of this, we can modify the way we use technologies or choose not to use them anymore. Now, this may mean that our values will be reaffirmed, but it may equally mean that our values can change. So, where does this leave us? Treating technologies as mediators rather than neutral tools does imply a new type of user responsibility. When using a new gadget, look at the practice that it enables. Ask yourself what its user interface and design promote, which actions become less possible, how it shapes your interaction with other people, whether there are new value conflicts or opportunities. When we analyze in such a way the way everyday technologies mediate our relations to ourselves, each other, and the world around, we also have a new type of freedom. This freedom lies in not shying away from technologies, but using them in an informed way, consciously giving shape to what is important to us, individually and collectively. Thank you. <laughs>